now it's my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Ernst Demuge. Uh, what is, do you mind me asking, um, Ernst, what is the correct pronunciation of your surname? Ernst Demoy. Demoy, I yep. beg pardon. Ernst oh, don't worry. <laughs> I've had bets at hotels in Hawaii with reception bets on how to pronounce it, so I'm used to it. <laughs> no, well, the, sorry, but if I had more time, I would have spoken earlier and got it. But Ernst de Moy, that's, that's the way. Okay. It's my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Ernst de Moy, um, with his talk, Investigating the Atmospheres of Alien Worlds. And as um, our webmaster, Paul has kindly pointed out. Uh, if you do have questions, please use the chat feature and then we can um, refer to them sequentially at the end of the talk. Okay, uh, th with that, it's over to you, Ernst. Thank you. All right, thanks. So it's a great pleasure to be here again. So let me start by sharing my screen and um, share it. it. Should work. Oh, let me move this one here out of the way other screen. All right. So you can all see my screen okay, I hope, with uh, yes. video playing. Yeah, so uh, good. Thanks for uh, inviting me. So, oops, why is my, there it is. So today I'm going to talk to you about how we can find the atmospheres of alien worlds. And I always like to start with uh, a question when I host these, when I give these talks. And uh, many of you have seen this in past examples, but probably not everyone. So can anyone tell me, uh, especially if you haven't seen it, what time of day this video here was taken at? So if you just type it in the chat, I'll keep an eye out for that. So can you tell me what time of day this was taken at? Don't see people. Do you have any ideas? So feel free to type it in the chat. I was gonna say I can do it like with my students and just tell them I'm not moving on uh, <laughs> until there's answers. Okay, good to see. Yep, it's taken at night and this is taken to what we call bright time. So basically when the full moon is out, as Paul uh, has it there, it's just a bit after midnight. And uh, this is typically when you study exoplanets, you're looking at bright stars and typically you go to La Palma to the darkest spot, the darkest site in the world, and you end up with time lapses at night that look something like this, which is somewhat uh, annoying. Uh, a follow-up question, can anyone point out uh, what constellation we're looking at? And basically you can see most of it right towards the end of the time lapse. It is a bit of a trick question because at the end, oops, there is an interloper uh, right here, which is actually one of the planets around solar system. So I do see there's more chats coming in that don't pop up here, but hopefully they'll get there soon. So uh, yeah, so we have this that's Mars here, and this is the front of the constellation of Leo for those that are interested. So today I'm not going to talk really about the planets in our own solar system, except to say how easy they are to find. What I'm going to talk to you about is how to find these alien worlds and then also characterize their atmospheres, right? So how we can go for something in our own solar system, like this image of Venus during the transit in 2004, where we can see the atmosphere basically there we can see the light from the sun filter refracting through the atmosphere to the earth, uh, allowing us to get some information to this uh, very high quality artist impression uh, I made myself where we have the planet in this case actually passing behind the star and we can learn something from it. Or uh, as one of the other things we're looking at, a planet passing in front of the star and you might just about make out that thin sliver of atmosphere where the starlight is filtering through and can tell us something about what's going on in the planet's atmosphere. So before we get there, we need to find that. And how do we do it in our own solar system? Well, we point uh, a telescope at it. So, the, uh, so for instance, the first one who actually did that was William Herschel. He actually found a new planet by pointing his telescope at the night sky. Uh, he thought he had found a comet, of course. 
it was a real, really a planet. Um, but in the solar system, we can do that. We can directly see the planets. They reflect sunlight and they're bright enough that you don't need a very large telescope, except when you start looking for these dwarf planets out in the far reach of the outer solar system that get so little light and reflect so little light back in the end uh, when it gets to Earth that you need quite a large telescope. But the problem is when we do this for exoplanets, so planets orbiting other stars, the distances are so great that it's really, really hard to do. And it has been likened to uh, looking for a firefly next to uh, a lighthouse. So just to show you the problem, what I have here is the relative brightness compared to the sun if you would look at the solar system from a distant star. So this here is one part in 100 million. This here is one part in 100 billion. And so on here, we have the different planets, uh, roughly in the correct uh, distances as well, that we might be interested in uh, observing if you would look at the solar system. And so we have Jupiter, which is, would be the brightest planet to look at, um, but it's not that far from its star, making it a more difficult observation, right? It's not as far from the sun, so it's not as clearly separated in the sky, and that will make observation more challenging, all the way to Neptune down here, who's pro that's the faintest uh, main planet that you might try to find. So these will be challenging because they're so much fainter. They're like this firefly next to the glare from a lighthouse, but properly scaled. So we can't really distinguish them, or at least I can't from this image. Nevertheless, for some planets, we can still distinguish them. So this is an image of a uh, planetary system uh, called HR 8799 here in the top with four planets and Beta Pictorius here uh, in the bottom, uh, where we've directly imaged the planets next to their stars. And the reason we were able to do that is that we are looking at very young planets that have just formed. So planets formed by the collapse, basically, or, or, or accretion of gas in the disk. And because the, the gas is condensing, right, it's sort of uh, compacting as well, it's releasing energy and that energy comes out as heat. So they're basically glowing from the leftovers of uh, their formation. And because they're so young, they haven't had time to cool down fully. And so we can see them. What's more for these planets, and I'm rotating the image in the bottom to show, to line it up with the next slide, have been actually observed to move in the sky. So this is based on real data uh, with some interpolation between to make it a smooth movie. But most of these are real images where we see the planet move across the sky. So we can actually track these planets moving around the star. And for this planet, Beta Pictoris, we actually now have it coming out on the other side, almost completing a full orbit. So we actually have a lot of data for these particular planets. But most planets won't be young, right? We typically uh, might want to look for something more like the Earth. They're not that young, it's, right? It's four and a half billion years. There's no leftover glow. And so this problem uh, is much, much harder. So for these planets, what we do is we look at the effects the planets have on their star. And one of the main things we can look at is the stellar wobble. So we always say that the Earth is orbiting the sun. What's technically more correct to say is that the Earth and the Sun orbit a common center of mass. So if we look at an image, we have a star and a planet, and this is exaggerated for scale here, just to make it more visible. The star is more massive than the planet, so it completes a much smaller orbit uh, around the center of mass, which is right here in the middle, while the planet is going around on a much larger orbit. Um, and uh, so we can try to track the motion of these. And typically, this is what we really would see, right? If we were able to have good measurement, we might be able to see the star wobble on the plane of the sky compared to the background stars. And this method is very tough because if we look at the solar system, for instance, this here is a graph 
basically looking at the solar system in astronomical units. So remember, one AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So this is uh, 250 times closer, roughly, than uh, the Earth is. That's roughly the Sun to scale. And we see that this very center of the solar system, so basically the center of mass of the solar system, moves just outside of uh, the star of the sun itself, right? And this big motion is caused by the planet Jupiter predominantly and in to lesser extent uh, Saturn as well. So we can see this, the sun wobble if you're looking at it from a distant star, but it's a very tiny uh, distance. So it's very, very hard to measure. But nevertheless, we hope that with a mission like ESO's Gaia, or ESA's Gaia mission, we can actually see uh, this wobble. So how can we measure this wobble uh, in another way? Well, we can take uh, advantage of the fact that atoms and molecules have very specific wavelengths at which they like to emit light. So here at the top is an hydrogen spectrum. Here at the bottom is an iron spectrum. And these have very, very characteristic wavelengths. So if you look at the spectrum of the sun, and this is actually one I took yesterday, well, technically it's a spectrum of a cloud uh, because I didn't have a, the sun shining into my room, but this is a spectrum of the sun. And what we can see here is all these lines. This is not noise. These are all absorption lines from different atoms and molecules. So for instance, these two lines are hydrogen. Uh, this one here is magnesium. These are here magnesium. And so we can know exactly by the wavelength where they are, uh, what materials they are. But what's more, these are very, very stable lines. So if uh, the star is moving, these lines will shift a little bit in wavelength, either red shifted or blue shifted. So if we look at what this might look like, we have hydrogen here at the top uh, or at the thing, and we have a stationary, so our base, our lab laboratory spectrum. And then if you observe a star over time, these lines might shift back and forth. And we can measure this shift, this periodic shift, to try and work out the velocity of the star. And so we can see the star coming towards us and moving away from us. Uh, if that goes repeatedly, we can then work out there's a planet going around the star, and we can then even work out things like the mass of the planet. The snack is this shift is very much exaggerated. In reality, the sun's velocity due to the Earth is just 0.4 kilometers per hour or 10 centimeters per second. So basically, uh, if my video is showing up roughly at this speed, that's what the sun is doing uh, due to the effect <clears throat> of the Earth. The sun's velocity due to Jupiter is about 40 kilometers per hour, which is a lot better. But still, it's the speed at which you're driving your car uh, in a town, right? So it's not a very high, high speed it's still very slow. And this is a ball of gas uh, more than a million kilometers across that's moving at these velocities and we're trying to measure that. So if we do this more realistically, this is what we see. So let me start the movie here. Yeah, it's, it's really, really, really tiny shift. You, don't, you can't see it on a scale like this. For instance, for the Earth, uh, I worked out that for one of the best spectrographs we have at the moment, it's something like one, uh, what is it again? One ten thousand of a pixel, if I do my math right, on that spectrograph that these lines shift. And that's zoomed in on a single line, right? So that's a tiny, tiny shift. Nevertheless, people have been trying this with very stable spectrographs, at a very high resolution, and then by measuring not just one line from the star, but all the lines we can do, uh, can see. These two people, uh, Michel Mayor and Didier Quello, uh, you observed a particular star called 51 Pack, and they noticed that periodically the star is coming towards us and moving away from us. So this is the measurement they actually had. So this is based on their data. We see that the star starts moving away from us and then comes back towards moving towards us and then it's moving away from us again uh, with time. And what they found was something quite interesting. Remember I said the Earth, it's 10 centimeters per second. Jupiter is 10 meters per second. What they observed here was a planet that's causing its star to wobble 
at roughly 58, uh, almost 60 meters per second. So that's a bit over 200 kilometers an hour. So that's actually compared to Jupiter quite uh, impressive. But what was more interesting was the time it took for the star and the planet to complete one orbit. The orbital time for this particular planet is 4.2 days. So this star is orbiting uh, the common center of mass in 4.2 days, which means that the planet is orbiting the common center of mass in 4.2 days, which means that the year on the planet lasts less than a working week here uh, on Earth. So these are really, really close to their stars. And this discovery, which was the first uh, planet around a sun-like star other than the sun, was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, now almost one and a half years ago uh, in physics, which they shared with uh, another project for astronomy. So they got half the Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of this planet. And this planet is extreme in a way compared to our own solar system. So here to scale, I have in green, uh, 51 Pegasi uh, B, as the planet is originally named. So B just means the first planet in the system. And then on the same scale, I've plotted, uh, shown Mercury and Venus here, uh, roughly scaled to, to the same size. And so you can see that the orbit of this planet is so close to its star, which means it must it's very, very hot. So this star or this planet is well over a thousand degrees. So it's really, really nice and roasty on the day side of this planet but it's also very close to the star. And we actually have found planets that orbit their star in just one day, and even planets that have day-side temperatures in excess of 4,000 uh, Kelvin, and that makes them as hot as, uh, or hotter than most of the red dwarfs or the M stars uh, that we know of. So over time, our the technology improved. We, re we are able to move, measure smaller and smaller signals. So one example of a smaller signal is Proxima Centauri B, uh, here seen in Artist Impression, which orbits one of those red M stars. And this is the measurement here, where you can see that the star wobbles at roughly a meter per second over a period of just over 10 days, right? Or about 10 days. So basically we've been able to get better and better measurements to detect smaller and smaller planets. The problem with this technique is that it's not only hard to do because these amplitudes, these signals are very small. There's a lot of other things that affect our results that make it even harder to see. To, do the, to show this, I have a very simple example here of Alpha Centauri BB, which was uh, claimed to exist in 2012. And People observed Alpha Centauri B, so one of the closest stars to the sun, part of the Alpha Centauri binary. And what we know about the star is that just like the sun, it has star spots, it has splash, so active activity. And over the time of their observation, so this is their entire observation range, it went from very quiet down here, so the star is less active here. And then over time, the activity increases. And what you can see if you zoom in, you can see that the activity is modulated as well on a time scale of maybe 40 or so days, or 30 to 40 days, which is based on the rotation period of the star. So we can see the activity change that we measure change over time because the sunspots and plage move out of our view on the back of the star and then move back into it, into view again. So we can see these huge modulations. And unfortunately, these modulations have an impact on the velocity. So here they've just subdivided the plot. So this is the rate of velocity. So how far fast is the star moving from minus six to plus six meters per second? And you can see these wibbles in here. And these wibbles, especially here where it gets more uh, larger, these wibbles get larger, are just induced by the activity from the star. So basically it's the star spots and... Um, all the other active features that you might see uh, on the sun as well that are there, they cause these velocity shifts. And that's a problem because these velocity shifts can induce signals. So they claimed this signal here, which is roughly at uh, half a meter per second amplitude, but 
when people reanalyze the data, they found two issues. One is that the way we did the sum, they did the sampling, so basically observed at specific intervals they, that affected uh, and then have gaps of specific lengths that affected their results. And B, the stellar activity is very hard to deal with. And so uh, it turned out that this planet actually doesn't exist. It was just a combination of the way the observations were done, so how frequently they were done, and stellar activity that sort of gave us a spurious signal. So this is one of the cautionary tales uh, to look at. So to solve this, uh, Queens is part of the terror hunting exper experiment, uh, which is uh, with HARP-3. Uh, HARP-3 is a new spectrograph that will be mounted on this telescope here, the Isaac Newton telescope on the Palma. Um, it will be basically the same as is used in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, HARPS uh, at the Telescope Internationale de Galileo in the north, uh, which is HARPS North. And this will be a third copy of the instrument that will go on this telescope and then observe a small sample of stars very, very frequently for a very long time. So basically what this will allow us to do is then measure these uh, stellar effects, but also have very good sampling so we don't have those issues that plague the Alpha Centauri BB uh, claim. One problem still with this uh, method, with the velocity method, is that we don't know the orbit of the planet. So if we look at the planet's orbit, and the planet's orbiting basically on the plane of the sky, the star is not coming towards or moving away from us, so we don't measure any change. So any planet that have, a, have their orbital plane so in, inclined, so it's just on the plane of the sky, we wouldn't see the wobble with this method. But even if we have a planet's orbit that's tilted, so it's, the star is still moving a bit towards us and away from us, the wobble is reduced because we don't see the full uh, wobble velocity, we just see a projected uh, velocity, so the signal is smaller. Only if the planets are aligned in such a way that they're exactly edge on can we measure the true velocity from that the true mass of planets. So there's some caveats with this technique. But this last uh, configuration, or even in something that's very close to it, gives rise to another thing, transits. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to try to do an experiment, and I know these typically tend to fail. So I'm going to switch over to my Raspberry Pi here and start uh, the camera. So what I've done is I've set up a Raspberry Pi with a camera and a lens aimed at a big light bulb that's acting as the star. And this, around this planet, a star, there may be a planet. So we can see here basically probably the uh, 50 hertz uh, signal from the light uh, bulb fluctuating a little bit. But if I now start, what we see is there's a planet going across. And this planet blocks out part of the light. So you should be able to see this decrease here in brightness as the planet is blocking the star. And this decrease in brightness is directly related to the size of this planet compared to the size of the star. So we can measure the size of uh, the planet. And thereby, if we then do this wobble technique to measure the mass, we also know the exact angle. We can then uh, work out uh, the density of the planet, which is very useful because that can tell us what's going on with the planet. So now, um, we have the planets moved off, and now we would have to wait an entire orbit. So unfortunately, the way it's set up, I can't rotate it around. But a little bit later, during a, when it completed its orbit, and in this case, it will go the wrong way around, it goes in front of the star again and blocks the light again. And we can see this dip, and that dip will be periodic, and we can look for that. So, oops. Let me move back here. Uh, just to show it again, we have the star, we have the light from the star, and basically time here. Over time, as the planet goes along, it blocks the light from the star. And this difference here in light is directly related to the radius of the planet compared to the radius of the star. And if you want to be precise, it's just a square of the radii. So it's easy 
to detect, we can use this to determine the radius of these planets if we know the radius of the star. So let's see how large this is. I already told you that the, double, uh, the Doppler wobble is very, very small and a very small effect. So let's take a look at this. So if we look at it, what we see here is a planet. We might think that this could be a planet. Well, this, if that star is the sun, would be about two or three times the size of Jupiter, much, much larger than we expect. This is roughly Jupiter to scale with the sun. Jupiter blocks about 1% of the light from the sun. If we want to see something like the Earth, we need to go even further. We need to go all the way down to this size. And in this case, the Earth is blocking just 0.01% of the light, or actually a little bit less. So that's a percent of a percent of the light from the star is blocked by a planet the size of the Earth. So this is hard, right? These signals are small. We need these planets aligned. So what we want to do is observe bright stars where you can get lots of light and also observe as many of them at the same time as we can. So there's surveys like SuperWASP here on the left, which uses digital camera lenses with professional CCDs to get uh, images of large chunks of the sky and try to find planets. We have instruments like HATS here on uh, Mauna Kea, which again do the same. They stare at specific pieces of uh, light and they work out how large the planet is. But they're doing it from Earth and that has a problem that the Earth's atmosphere is in the way. So here I have two stars. Let's call them star A and star B. And on in the graphs here, I show how much the light that we detect from both from each of the stars is as a function of time. One of these stars has a planet. So can anyone in the chat uh, feel free to, to type what you, star do you think has uh, the planet? See a B. Can't tell an A. Uh, uh, okay, so I see an A, a B, uh, not quite clear. Well, if you compare very carefully, and let's ho hope that this works, the curve here for star B, and you compare it to star A, you might just about see that. Star A has a slight dent here in the light curve. There's this big dip that both stars have, but there's also a slight extra decrease here in star's A light curve. And this is quite a, a good example of why this is a problem. So what we can do is we can use this light curve from star B, divide the light curve from star A out of, uh, by it, and what we get here is this nice transit where we can, again, see that the uh, uh, top part is here. And we see that the light decreases by about 2.5 to 0.5%. So it's a tiny, tiny difference, but we can detect this quite well, right? So we need to be careful, but we can do this. However, this becomes more problematic to the smaller the planet we're looking for. Uh, is. So to do that, people have been launching space missions. So for instance, Kepler that actually stared at the same piece of sky for four years. They are sort of the animation, what they do. They looked at a small patch of sky uh, nearby uh, sickness. Um, and, they star and it stared at it for four years continuously to look for these dips in uh, light from uh, planets blocking the star. And that's been very, very successful. Far out to most planets currently known, exoplanets currently known have been discovered by the Kepler mission. And we found things where there's a multi-planet system with not just one, but one, two, three, four, five, six planets, all within the orbit of Venus. Five of these planets actually have an orbit that's smaller than the orbit of Mercury. So this is a very, very scorched together system. And 
what's more, we found many, many of these multi -syst planet systems in Kepler. So the solar system is here to, for comparison, the top left. But there's lots and lots of planets in different types of orbits with more or system with more than one planet. So these discoveries have basically boosted the number of planets significantly. So now the great thing is we have these planets, we found them. We now want to learn a bit more about them. We might have measured their density. We might have measured uh, their masses. But what we really want to know is, do they have an atmosphere? And if so, what's that atmosphere uh, made up of? So how do we find that? Well, again, in the solar system, uh, it's easy, right? We're looking at, for instance, here, Venus. We see the very thin sliver here where, star where the sunlight gets refracted through the atmosphere. It gets imprinted by information from the atmosphere, and we can tell it that way. Uh, on Earth, we have space missions, spacecrafts going around. And you can see this thin blue line, which is basically our, all of the Earth's atmosphere. We can see that directly. On Mars, we have uh, landed uh, rovers that has actually have taken pictures of sunsets, so we know what the sunset looks like. We can do direct measurements of Mars, uh, both from the surface and from space. But for exoplanets, it's almost impossible, except if we look at these directly imaged planets, like shown here for HR 8799, where they observed and took a spectrum and they find some water absorption and then methane and carbon monoxide. So there we can directly take a spectrum just like we might do for planets in our solar system. But for most planets, that's not quite possible. The cool thing is for these directly imaged planets, we can do another trick. If we look at the planet and, and that planet is rotating, we can turn on our basic Doppler glasses to see the surface. So one part of the surface here on the left is coming towards us. The other part is moving away from us. So light em emitted by the left part will be blue shifted compared to light emitted by sort of the central part and light emitted by the red part, red shifted part, the part that's moving away from us is actually red shifted. And so if we measure the light as a whole, we see that the line is actually broadened because we're combining light from different sections uh, together. And so for beta pictorius B, one of the planets I showed at the start with the orbit, uh, it's sort of shown here in that image, they measured this. And so this doesn't say much, right? They see that the light from the planet, the line is broadened. But if you compare it what you expected, if it was a planet that's not rotating, it's much, much narrower. And so what we can tell is that this extra width here that we measure is actually the rotation uh, of the planet. And so we can work out that this particular planet is rotating around its axis at roughly 25 kilometers per second. So it's really going very, very fast around its axis, much faster than Jupiter and Saturn, our solar system. But it sort of fits the trend what we expect happens when um, we look at uh, the planets in terms of how they get, get rotating and form. But that's only possible for um, exoplanets. What we can do is we can look at these planet exoplanets again, and now I'm doing a zoom in of the system. So I'm just pretending we have a very good telescope. We can actually see it separated. We have the star here in the middle and the planets going around during the transit. So when the planet passes between us and the star, the light from the star goes through this uh, thin sliver here which uh, will basically then get imprinted with the signal. And we can look at this in transmission. So to do this, I want to have a, show you another short demonstration using a spectrograph. So here's sort of the innards. If you have questions about this, feel free to ask. I'll show it. Uh, I can open it. It's right sitting right next to here in the end. Uh, this is the one I used to take this uh, spectrum with. But what I have here and I hope you can see that on the camera feed, is a small LED, which represents uh, basically the star, uh, a small tube that contains a lens that's basically representing our telescope here on Earth. 
And that light goes into a, an optical fiber that links the spectrograph uh, to the telescope. So this is basically similar to what's used by, for instance, harps uh, or any of these things to get the light from the telescope into uh, the spectrograph. And what I have here as well is a whole bunch of different uh, color filters. So I have a few red, green, blue, orange um, filters, and I have a few more uh, amateur astronomy filters, like an ultra high contrast light pollution filter, which looks something like this, and a solar continuum filter, which is quite greenish. And what I'm going to do now is show um, the spectrum that you get when light goes through one of these filters. And I'll start with a simple example here. So it takes a while to get this going. There it is. So basically what this is measuring is how much light gets through uh, the filter. So if I put a green filter in front of it, it takes about a second to update. What you can see is that basically it blocks a lot of light here below 460 uh, nanometers. And then towards 580 nanometers, it basically drops off. My spectrograph doesn't quite go uh, further to the red, so I can't show you what happens there. Uh, but we can tell a little bit uh, about the transmission, right? So what this filter does, this green filter works by blocking red and bl blue light effectively and just letting through uh, the green. So if I now pick a random other filter, uh, can you in the chat guess what, what type of... Oh, there goes my light source. It should take... Okay, what kind of filter this is here? Okay, I see red, I see a blue. Okay, I see red. <clears throat> Greenish. So, well... Let's lift it up and hold it in front of the camera. <laughs> so this is actually a yellow filter. And so you can see it blocks a lot of the, the green light and the blue light, but this is hard to guess because this filter here um, actually lets more red light through rather than what we can show in the spectrograph. So let me take another filter here. And Let's see if we if you can guess what kind of filter this might be. Okay, see an H alpha. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't my wavelength doesn't quite go red enough for H alpha. Hmm. Well, this is actually a narrowband filter, uh solar continuum filter, so it's a green filter. Uh, that's used uh, for better contrast on the solar surface in your telescope if you use it with a nice a proper solar filter. And what's interesting is that depending on how you tilt the filter, you can actually shift the wavelength a little bit. So I'm tilting the filter slowly. You can, might see the wavelength just move back and forth. And that is because you use something called interference, where the light sort of reflects between the two filter parts and only specific wavelengths can go through. And a similar technique is used for this filter, which is one of those, ultra, uh, those contrast filters, light pollution filters. If I put that in front of the camera here, you see it actually has a nice broad band, and then it blocks out a lot of light between 540 and, oh, that was my light source going out again, 540 and uh, longwards, where basically a lot of our street lights emit light. So that's how these works. These, these filters block out chunks where there's, for instance, a lot of street lights emitting uh, most of their light and making it harder to see. And that's why you get a better contrast. And so this filter actually does include, for instance, hydrogen beta, which is around here, or oxygen, which is roughly around here. Uh, so that's why they are very good at observing uh, nebulae and things like that, where you have these... Um, signals. So as I said, if you have any questions about the spectrograph as well, feel free to ask. I'm happy to show it after this talk as well, a bit more in detail. 
So how does this work with planets? Well, in this case, we're going to look at two lights, two wavelengths of light. One wavelength where the atmosphere is transparent and we can see that we effectively measure radius roughly like this, right? The atmosphere is transparent, the light just passes through and basically only the surface blocks uh, the light. So this could, for instance, be if we look through a green filter at a green wavelength of light or for planet atmosphere, if we look at uh, sodium, uh, or sorry, at uh, green light in the atmosphere that has a lot of sodium in it where the green light just goes through. But if we then look at sodium, the light from the star gets absorbed in the planet's atmosphere and the planet will appear much larger. So that's shown here on the right again um, with a much deeper transit. So if we compare the two, when we look, for instance, green lights in the atmosphere with a lot of sodium, we measure the radius here. But if we look at sodium itself, which gets absorbed by the atmosphere, we suddenly see that the planet appears larger. Of course, these are again tiny signals, so it's not an easy thing to do. But um, nevertheless, we can try that. And so I just want to show you a few short examples. This is data taken with the Hubble Space Telescope by uh, Singh et al. And this bump here, and this is one of the difficulties we find, is not due to the planet directly. It's due to the planet going over a sunspot or star spot. So just as the sun has dark spots, stars have dark spots, the planet crosses that and that gives a bump in the light curve. So you need to correct for that. But when they do, they find something interesting. So here on the x-axis, we see the wavelength, so basically color of light. On the y-axis, we see the size of the planet. And what you find is if we go from the red here to the blue, we see that the size of the planet appears to increase. And if you think back what that means, that means that blue light gets absorbed more in the planet's atmosphere. So the planet's atmosphere acts a bit like a red filter, right? It absorbs blue light, but lets red light through, not quite unhindered, but much less affected. And so using this data, people have made simulations. So this is what uh, a sunset on this planet would look like. It's a gas giant, so you can't really stand on its uh, surface. But because it scatters a lot of blue light, you see a sort of a reddish sunlight, which would be uh, similar to what we have on Earth. Let's compare to another planet. So we have here a planet called HD209458b. Uh, again, one of those nice names. Um, and in this case, this planet is quite a little sodium. And the data here, that's the black lines coupled with the red lines, seem to have a sort of bump here around sodium. And then maybe a little bit of scatter here towards uh, bluer wavelengths. And if you look at what we predict the sunset would look like, would look like something like this. This planet is actually quite close to its star and is actually actively losing um, some of its atmosphere in the form of a hydrogen tail that sort of like, looks like a comet, but this is a planet where the atmosphere is being blown away. And that's sort of this an arts impression of what that might look like. So we can tell quite a lot from this transit method. What's more fun is that we can combine some techniques we've used before. So we have a star and a planet, they're orbiting the common center of mass. And while the star is moving at a very small velocity because it's moving just a tiny, tiny bit, right? The sun is moving at 0.1 meter per second, so 10 centimeters per second. The earth is going along its orbit at 30 kilometers per second. So any atoms and molecules in the earth's atmosphere will be red shifted and later blue shifted by that amount, right? By 30 kilometers per second as it goes along its orbit. If we look at ultra hot Jupiters, the star might be moving at maybe 100 meters per second. So that's 360 kilometers per hour. So uh, quite fast, but planets might be moving at over 200 kilometers per second, right? So you would be very, if you move at that speed, you'll be in Dublin in a second or so. So that's really, really, really fast. And we can use this, if you observe during the transit, 
the light from the star will go through the plant's atmosphere, but because specific atoms and molecules, again, as I said, for the Doppler method, we rely on that, absorb at specific wavelengths, we can now look for the signal. So this is a model where we just tried to see what we predict, what we should see, if this planet, this particular planet had an atmosphere. So we see that during the transit, the planets will change velocity from be coming towards us at 50 kilometers per second to moving away from us at over 50 kilometers per second. And this black bar here is basically the absorption of the planet that we see from this particular uh, species. So this is actually water we're looking at. So this is what we would hope to see. Unfortunately, what we see in reality is complete noise. Even if we try to combine exactly all the signal here along the line, right? We want to combine this line and we do that same with the real data. What we see is this black line here is the real data. The signal from the model is here in gray. So unfortunately, we didn't see water in this particular planet, but it does show that we can in principle do this if we get good enough data and if the plants are cooperating by having an atmosphere of water in it in this particular case. But it's not just water we can do. We've done it with iron. We've done it with some species called titanium oxide. We've done it with carbon monoxide. So we can do it with a lot of different species and look for this ex uh, movement of the planet as it goes along its orbit. Then if you have a transit, the planet goes in front of the star, half an orbit later, roughly, the planet will actually pass behind the star. This means that the light from the planet gets blocked. And so again, with an artist impression here, so this is where the planet is passing behind the star. So we see more and more of the planet disappear behind the star. And so we see this decrease here in flux as the planet gets blocked. Uh, so we only see the star. So here we have just a star. And here we have star plus planet. And that means that this here, this difference here is just the planet light. Uh, and so with this planet light, if we can measure that, we can then uh, determine properties. And for this particular uh, planet, we worked out that the temperature on the day side is over 3000 degrees uh, Celsius, right? So this is a very, very toasty planet. For comparison, um, one of the famous exoplanet systems called GJ1214b, its host star, so the star the planet orbits, is just over 3,000 Kelvin. So this is hotter than some of the stars that actually have planets themselves. So this is an extreme uh, planet here. What's interesting is if you do observations of multiple times, it's done by uh, Matthew Houghton, who was a PhD student here in uh, Queens. Uh, last year is now in uh, Switzerland, in Bern. Uh, we did observations on two nights separated by a year with two telescopes using otherwise the same setup. And one night we see this very deep eclipse. And the next night the eclipse is much, much shallower. So that's strange. Well, what could this mean? Well, if we make this graph here of the flux that we measure, this here is the Liverpool transit observation here at the bottom. This here is the measurement with the INT. We see that they change brightness quite significantly in time. And that means that the planet may be hotter. If this is real, this means that the planet increased its day side temperature by 300 uh, degrees roughly, or 200 degrees roughly. And that means that we might be looking at weather or gigantic storm on uh, this, on another planet. So that's quite cool that we might be able to do that. Finally, we can look at something else called the phase curve. So I've shown this movie before. If the planet going in transit, it blocks light from the stars. We just see this big dip. But then as we continue to monitor it, monitor it we see more and more of the planet's day side rotate into view. So you can see a very slow increase here in the brightness from the planet with time. And that's because we see more and more of the day side until basically half an orbit later, it will pass behind the star. And this here is basically changing phases of a planet. 
And this was observed first in the solar system by Galileo for Venus, where he noticed that the sliver that's illuminated would change in uh, over time as Venus goes around the sun. So we can see that for exoplanets as well. In this case, we, if for exoplanets, because the star is so far away and the planet is relatively close to its star, the size of the planet won't change, right? It's always the same distance from us, uh, more or less. But what we do see is that we see during trends, we look at the night side. Just before secondary eclipse, we look at the day side. So we can see these brightness changes. And we can do fun things with that, like make a map of the temperature of the planet. So this is not a map of the surface like we're used to it. This is a measurement of how the temperature varies across the planet. And technically, it's only measured in one dimension uh, because we don't have uh, good enough data to really solve it any further. But we can do uh, this not just for uh, one planet. We have data for many planets. So just another example. This is a planet called Kepler-8. And we can see interesting things. So we see the planet transit here, which in this case is uh, roughly 1%, just under 1%, or just over almost 10,000 parts per million. But then the secondary eclipse, just for comparison, the size of this effect is just 20 parts per million. So that's uh, almost uh, 500 times smaller, right? So we're looking at tiny, tiny changes. We've managed to do this for a super Earth, so a planet that's a little about two times the size of the Earth, oh, called Kepler 10. In this case, here you see the transit. Here uh, you see the phase curve, and we actually see the light variations of this planet. And the reason we can do this is that this super Earth goes around the star in about 20 hours. So one year on the planet is shorter than a day here on Earth. And that means it has a temperature of over 2,500 degrees uh, centigrade, right? So this is really, really uh, extreme environments we're looking at at the moment. But if you're looking at a lot of these, you might notice interesting things. Like for here, that the brightest point is actually on this side, while the brightest point here is on the other side. And this is likely not any instrumental effect. This is actually something that tells us something that's going on in the planet. And what we think this tells us is sort of something about weather processes on these two planets. So Kepler-76 is one of these very, very hot, so-called ultra-hot Jupiters. Kepler-12 is sort of a more moderate hot Jupiter, maybe about eh, 16, 1700 degrees there. Well, this one might be almost 3000 degrees, so it's both are not comfortable, but this one's definitely cooler. And what we think we may be looking at, at is just where the brightest point of the planet is, uh, depending on what, how hot the planet is. So if you have a hot planet, the brightest point is actually expected to be, if you were on the planet, what you would call the afternoon side of the planet. So if you know on Earth, the hottest time of the day is not exactly when the sun is straight overhead. It's actually a little bit afterwards because the atmosphere sort of has a heat capacity. The same here goes for these planets that are very hot. The hottest point is actually after uh, the star has crossed the meridian. So it's uh, basically moved on towards the afternoon. And the afternoons on these planets are hottest. But if we look at cooler planets, what we actually think we're looking at is some clouds that are reflecting light. And if the day side is very hot, clouds just evaporate. But on the night side, clouds can condense out. And so we expect that the morning is cloudy on these planets. And then later on, it, it sort of clears up. Uh, by noon, the clouds may have disappeared. And in the afternoon, you may have just, well, sunny skies as much as you can, right? So that's sort of the basic idea sort of gen uh, in a general way. For one planet, we've been looking at this over time. And for this particular planet, we've seen that this hottest point or brightest point shifts from here, where it's in the morning, or here, for in, or wait, sorry, where it's in the afternoon, to cases later on, like here, where it's in the morning. So we might even be able to see storms on alien worlds. And I have a small bit, but I think I'll leave that out 
uh, and just end here. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I've seen a few already pop up in the chat. Uh, we'll, I'll go over them and uh, try to answer those. If you have any further questions, please feel free to ask.